All right, so before I dive in, I wanted to just um, give you a high level overview of, of ECRI, which uh, some people um, who've been around a long time refer to us as ECRI, um, interchangeable either way. Um, but ECRI was founded in 1970, uh, or in and around there by Dr. Joel Noble, who was a neurosurgeon from the Philadelphia area. He shown there, um, he witnessed uh, a, an unplanned event happen in a hospital involving a medical device, and also noticed that at that time in the 70s, there was an explosion of healthcare technology in hospitals and very little independent information about its safety and effectiveness. So he founded ECRI to be an independent organization where hospitals could turn for unbiased information about medical technology. In the 50 years since then, we certainly have expanded and grown our focus. And today we describe ourselves as an independent nonprofit agency whose mission is to advance evidence-based healthcare globally. So you can see the shift from medical technology to healthcare delivery in general. We kind of divide ourselves into three pillars, technology decision support, patient safety, and evidence-based medicine. Um, some of you may know ECRI from our health devices alerts, which falls under the patient safety pillar. Um, some of you may have heard of our capital guide product. That's a supply chain solution that we offer. But I come from healthcare incident investigation and technology consulting. Um, can I have a show of hands of how many people knew that ECRI did third party independent incident investigations? Yes, yeah, so we've been doing that for over 40 years and uh, we've performed um, countless number of investigations on a very large array of medical devices. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, um, healthcare incident management and investigation. So here are our learning objectives. We're gonna to try to understand the importance of effective incident investigations. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna introduce the seven point IMI plan, which is a investigation methodology that ECRI kind of has developed in that 40 years and honed, and we're gonna apply the process to an actual healthcare incident that ECRI investigated. So when an unexpected incident happens during the delivery of healthcare, it can result in serious injury and, or death or legal claims. Here are some statistics. According to the World Health Organization, uh, 14th leading cause of morbidity or mortality across the world. In high income countries, it's estimated that one in 10 are harmed while receiving hospital care. And 50% of those have in general be considered preventable. And finally, medical errors were the third leading cause of death in the US according to a Johns Hopkins study in 2018. It's crucial that healthcare systems properly manage and investigate those incidents. However, this can be easier said than done, especially if complex medical technology is involved. So before I go any further, I talk about healthcare incidents and I wanted to define what that sort of means. So um, I use the word incidents to include both accidents and near misses or close calls. In general, accidents are unplanned or undesired events that result in harm, and the near miss or close call is on something that could result in harm. But we should strive to investigate and prevent both. So why investigate? In a nutshell, we want to determine what happened and prevent it from happening again. Uh, to decrease the risk to both patients and staff members. But we also investigate because it is often required by governing entities or uh, certifying bodies or insurers. I do want to um, acknowledge that incident management and investigation is just one piece in a puzzle that uh, is much larger to achieve a higher reliability in the delivery of healthcare. But if we don't strive 
to understand what went wrong, we can't possibly expect to prevent it from happening again. So the goal of incident management investigation is simple. It's to determine the cause and implement recommendations to prevent recurrence. Uh, straightforward goals, but investigations can be plagued with difficulties. For example, incidents can involve a wide diversity of technologies, and uh, some are relatively simple, like syringes, others are far more complex, like surgical robots. And for each device, there can be numerous causes of injury. So an infusion pump can, uh, you know, in, an incident involving infusion pump could be caused by an over-infusion and under-infusion, misprogramming, even um, a problem with the disposables. Lines of communication can often break down during the investigation process, making it difficult to get reliable information. And patient-specific factors can come into play and they can vary greatly. The manufacturer of the equipment may or may not be forthcoming in information. And implementation of recommendations sometimes does not um, include those people that um, have to carry them out, and it can make it difficult to get sustained compliance. But we're going to try to master the process of not just investigations, but incident management as a whole. So as I mentioned, ECRI has been doing investigations for over 40 years, and uh, we have developed and refined an investigation methodology, which we like to call the IMI plan. It's a seven-point plan, and there are the points listed there. They include awareness, response, fact-gathering, analysis, conclusions, recommendations, and legal issues. It should be noted that the points often overlap and inform each other. So let's start with point one. Point one is awareness. It might seem like a strange place to start, but an organization can only analyze and act on incidents that they are aware of. Incidents awareness can start, usually starts with the clinical staff. During the delivery of healthcare, they notice that uh, something unexpected has happened, a complication or an injury. And they realize that, or they realize there might have been a near miss or a close call. However, awareness can also um, initiate from people outside of the healthcare setting. A patient or family member can notice that there's been an injury or a bad outcome. Sometimes you hear from the medical device manufacturer that there's been a problem with the device and you realize that's happened at your hospital. You may be informed by regulatory agencies like the FDA or the CDC. Uh, sometimes a legal action or insurance claim informs or makes you aware, and then uh, independent agencies like ECRI sometimes are the source of awareness. Incident awareness can be concurrent with the incident in, in, or injury or subsequent to it. With concurrent, you're immediately aware that something's gone wrong. For example, um, if a stapler used during surgery incompletely seals the vessel that it's uh, cutting and stapling, it results in hemorrhage. You become aware of that immediately. But with subsequent awareness, you become aware that there's been a problem sometime later. For example, maybe you discover a foreign object on routine radiographs months after a procedure. That would be a subsequent awareness. Every effort should be made to create a culture of reporting. Uh, where incidents are immediately reported because delayed awareness can have profound effects on the investigation process. For example, accessories may be discarded, hindering the subsequent investigation, or the device maybe uh, continues to be used. It, it isn't sequestered, and that can result in the loss of stored information, or you could have uh, the incident happen again, maybe with a more severe outcome. Listed here are some strategies to create a culture of reporting. The first one, make reporting safe. Uh, establish an internal reporting mechanism that encourages open and honest sharing of information and allow reporting to be confidential and maybe sometimes uh, maybe even anonymous. Make reporting easy. Uh, have a well-defined process that's consistent across departments. 
um, build it into the workflow if you can. And then educate and train your staff, um, not only on what should be reported and to whom, but the, the important part that they play in the awareness piece. They are the frontline staff um, and how important it is that they share you know, what they see and, and hear. Take reports seriously and um, take both incidents and near misses seriously. Acknowledge to the reporter um, and assure them that your report will be, their report will be acted on. And provide support to the caregivers because often they are victims as well. So point two is response. Uh, it's important that the healthcare, that your healthcare facility has a pre-established response plan and that all potentially involved personnel, including clinicians and biomedical engineering, um, are educated on that plan. So ECRI's created a poster that outlines five immediate action steps that can be taken for a thorough and coordinate, coordinated incident response. Assuming that there's no persistent unsafe condition present, which would require you to first secure the area, the first step would be attend to the injured. This can include the patient or clinician or even a visitor. Step two is preserve the equipment and the environment. You wanna preserve anything that may have caused or contributed to the incident. Staff should be educated and periodically reminded about the importance of evidence preservation. Uh, you can use the acrostic SAVED. Uh, S stands for settings. You wanna document uh, equipment settings um, and what they were and whether or not um, there were any displayed error codes that would be important to gather. A stands for accessories. Uh, when possible, you wanna leave the accessories connected to the equipment the way that it was at the time of the incident. V stands for valuable data. So save paper printouts, print and download data out of the devices if they have stored logs. Being aware that um, some of the stored patient data can be lost when you turn the device off. And although alarm settings and uh, event logs are usually retained longer than that, continued use of the device can overwrite things like that. And E stands for equipment. You want to preserve the equipment in the state of, that it was at the time of the incident until it can be examined and tested by qualified personnel. And D stands for disposables. Save those disposables, including packaging, if possible, because sometimes you want to know the serial number or lot number of a disposable, and it may require retrieving the packaging from the trash. Uh, the most common mistakes we see are the discarding disposables and overwriting the logs that are stored in the equipment. You may want to consider preserving the environment in which the incident took place. If you think environmental factors are believed to have played a role, you want to consider things like temperature sometimes, lighting, uh, electrical power, medical gas, and even sometimes strange odors that uh, maybe were reported. So the third point in that action plan is uh, report the incident. We've touched on this a little bit, but you want uh, incidents to be reported in a timely manner to the appropriate person within the organization because you can only act on what you're aware of. And step four, sequester equipment. That prevents defective devices from uh, continuing to be used on patients and it uh, allows uh, the data to be um, preserved before uh, it might get over overwritten. <clears throat> and point number five, you wanna go ahead and gather additional evidence. So those can be things like photos of the environment or the device at the, you know, showing maybe what the settings were. Um, the stored data we mentioned, the, the data logs. Uh, you want to consult the health record and gather information from the EHR or pertinent medical records. Um, you want to get an incident report or a detailed description as soon as possible about what happened so that the recollections are fresh. It's often very helpful to gather some exemplars of the disposables or the device in use because that allows comparison during your investigation. Um, device documentation, you want to look at the or, or get a copy of the um, instructions for use 
or the operators and service manuals, um, even the inspection and repair records. And last, you wanna consider whether there were any policies and procedures uh, that your hospital has that, that you, know, you wanna compare and see if they had been followed. So you wanna gather, gather that information. Responding to an incident is not a one-person job. It takes a team. Uh, the NTSB has GO teams that they put together to respond to accidents like plane crashes. We should have something similar, like a GO team in the healthcare arena. We could call them the IMI committee, and they would be made up of in, you know, a group of personnel that had different roles to play depending on the incident. One person or department should coordinate uh, the IMI committee, and that's usually risk management. Um, if not, there can be multiple parallel investigations going on, exploring different theories and creating redundancy. So investigation coordination is important, and they pull together the team of you know, people shown there, depending on the incident, that would have contributions to make. All right, point three is fact gathering. And it often begins in parallel with points one, awareness, and point two, response. We like to call uh, fact gathering, uh, or we like to use the, the catchphrase, mind your P's and Q's during fact gathering, with the Q's being the questions you wanna ask to create a, a good feel as to what happened, and P represents the sources of those facts. And the two go together hand in hand. So let's talk about the cues. The cues are those questions you wanna to ask to get a clear incident description. That's the who, what, when, where, why. And then the P's are the places you go to find those facts. So the place where the incident occurred, the products that were in use, the personnel involved, the procedure being performed, and last of all, the patient. When considering the place where the uh, incident occurred, you wanna consider possible physical or structural aspects, things like electrical power, maybe that was involved, was there medical gas involved, was there was lighting contributing to this, was there noise, um, were there any recent structural changes in that area of the hospital? And consider obtaining security video if you think it would be helpful and it's available. When you're looking at the products that were in use, Consider the accessories and disposables, the instrument settings. Consider whether those instrument settings were in the typical range or maybe were set uh, outside what would be considered typical. You might wanna consider device ownership. Are the devices involved owned by the facility? Are they leased? Are they on loan? Um, you wanna look at maintenance. When was the last time the, the, the equipment was um, maintained or inspected? You might want to look at purchase records or service contracts, find out whether the device was subject to a recall or an alert. And you want to consider all the device interfaces. So you want to consider how the device interacts with the, interacted with the environment, with the user, with the patient, with the accessories and disposables, and maybe with other devices in use at the same time. Listed here are some evaluation methods we employ. Uh, we almost, you know, gross inspection, absolutely. You look at the equipment, were there any signs of damage um, or abuse? A lot of times microscopic ex examination can come into play, particularly with um, catheters. If a catheter has broken and left a remnant behind, you can microscopically examine the end and determine whether maybe there was a material defect in play. Um, you definitely want to recover that data from the logs or anything stored. Uh, you want to verify proper operations. So, you know, look at the, um, the instructions manual, run it through its, its general um, checkout. A lot of times you, you benefit from simulating the incident. So uh, how many times do you get the device and it works properly? It, you know, everything seems fine. You have to kind of go back to the drawing board say in the environment, in what, what was happening, can I simulate the incident and can I you know, reproduce what they're reporting? And sometimes we have to use advanced methods like uh, scanning electron microscopy. You wanna gather information from the personnel involved that usually you know, first and foremost is conducting interviews. Um, 
You also want to consider things like staffing levels at the time and whether uh, the staff was prop properly credentialed, what their training was, um, were there any contract service personnel involved, and was the device manufacturer's representative present? And if so, did he, you know, were there any role that was played by that? And then you want to look at the patient, consider the type of injury that they suffered, how was it treated, um, consider their medical history and whether they maybe had a susceptibility to injury, what was the result of the postmortem if it was done, and what's the attitude of the patient's family. And then you want to look at the procedure that was being performed. What was being done? Was it a new procedure? Um, you want to consider policies and procedures surrounding that. Were standards, uh, published standards of practice followed? You want to understand the workflow and Sometimes it can be very helpful to create an event timeline. It's important when gathering facts to avoid treating assumptions, opinions, and speculation as facts. Uh, our chief scientist likes to say facts are investigative bedrock, assumptions and opinions are shifting sand. So here are some tips for get fact gathering. You want to remain open-minded to minimize bias. You want to avoid hasty conclusions. You want to determine causes, not blame, and you want to standardize the process as much as possible. Once you've applied the P's and Q's, you should have a reasonable understanding of what actually happened, and you're ready to advance to the next two steps, which are analysis and conclusions. So point four is analysis, and the goal is to determine causation. So you're gonna analyze the facts, consider possible causes, rule out the causes that are inconsistent with the facts, and maybe rank the causes with degree of certainty. Um, you probably, probably don't have to say there's almost always more than one cause. So um, that has to be taken into consideration. <laughs> Listed here are some common causes of health in incidents. Uh, you can see the top ones are blue. Those are um, product related, uh, things like device defects or device malfunction. Um, the ones at the bottom are red. Those are more um, process related. Staff overload and fatigue is one, misuse, a failure to properly train and credential. And then the orange ones in the middle are sort of a combination of both product and process related. So, a device modification by the user or installation and maintenance errors. I wanted to touch on root cause analysis. Um, it's a process that's used to identify the basic or causal factors that underlie an incident. It starts by focusing on a problem statement and you ask why that occurred, and then the answer forms the basis for the next question of why, and you repeat the process until you get to the root cause. Um, RCA can be considered part of the analysis step of the IMI plan in that it seeks to determine causation. And then point five is conclusions. Um, conclusions are statements that clearly describe what caused and contributed to the incident. They should be used to inform messaging. Um, they can inform your recommendations. They inform reporting both internally and externally, and they can be the basis for your uh, legal, legal expert opinion. We like to say when you have reached the conclusions, you're halfway there. And that's because one cannot be satisfied with simply determining what happened. You want to prevent that recurrence. So recommendations should be drafted with that goal. Listed here are some characteristics of good recommendations. First of all, they should be clear and concise. They should mean what they say and say what they mean. They should consider the workflow, taking into consideration staffing levels, training, and the burden of implementation. You should keep in mind that a recommendation that cannot or will not be followed is not very helpful. They should also be consistent with best practices. Um, they should be collaborative, including the departments that they're going to affect in the drafting of recommendations. 
They should not be created in a vacuum. They should take into consideration standards of care, published standards, and the manufacturer's uh, information on how to use the equipment. Finally, they should be compliance verified. So what does that mean? It means um, that implementation should be verified through some form of monitoring. Uh, the verification process can include follow-up at predetermined time intervals and you update that as needed. If a compliance with a recommendation is not achieved, that recommendation doesn't have a lot of value. And point seven is legal issues. Uh, incidents can result in legal claims against healthcare providers. Claims of malpractice or negligence are probably the most common. And that involves um, what can be brought when a provider um, fails to meet a standard of practice or follow a policy or procedure. That's part of why a major component of legal considerations is determining whether applicable standards were followed or internal policies were followed. A product liability claim can be brought if a medical device is involved. That would be against the manufacturer for defective design, manufacture, or labeling. And last, uh, one that's not known so much, spoliation of evidence can be brought if devices are discarded, altered, or the stored data is lost. Legal considerations should begin with awareness and be considered for each step in the IMI plan because healthcare incidents always have the potential to result in legal action. As you gather facts following the incident, identify a liability, assess liability for each of the five Ps looking for negligence or criminal acts. Liability assessment requires offering, asking a lot of uncomfortable probing questions, but it's essential to the IMI plan. It helps uh, inform insurers and assists in legal defense preparation. Reporting is considered a legal consideration in that um, there are federal, federal reporting requirements under the Safe Medical Devices Act. Uh, that requires medical mandatory reporting of deaths caused or contributed to by medical technology used in healthcare facilities. You report to the FDA and to the medical device manufacturer within 10 days. Uh, serious injuries can also be recorded, reported to the manufacturer within 10 days and uh, voluntarily reported to the FDA. Uh, states also have requirements on reporting. They vary. Uh, accreditation uh, com committees like the Joint Commission, they, um, they gather events, sentinel events, and um, you can report them along with the findings of your uh, investigation. Voluntary reporting uh, can be done to any of the places that take in mandatory reports, but uh, also can be reported to ECRI's problem reporting network. So we take in problem reports from hospitals, whether they're members of ECRI or not. And finally, patient safety organizations, they gather reports from their hospital clients and um, that, those reports are afforded protection from discoverability because they're earmarked as PSWP, patient safety work product. And that is um, that in most states not discoverable. All right, we've made it through the seven points of the IMI plan. Let's apply the plan to an investigation that um, that ECRI was asked to participate in. Um, ECRI was asked to investigate an airway fire that occurred during laser ablation of an endobronchial tumor. So here's the background information. In preparation for a bronchoscopy, an endotracheal tube was positioned and 100% oxygen was delivered via the tube. A bronchoscope was inserted through the endotracheal tube to visualize the tumor, and a laser fiber was inserted through the working channel of the bronchoscope into the airway and laser ablation of the tumor was performed. During the removal of the laser fiber, after ablation, the surgical staff reported hearing a loud pop, and they noticed smoke around the patient's face, and they lost visualization through the bronchoscope. 
So let's apply our seven points. First, awareness. That one's pretty easy, straightforward in this case. They were immediately aware that something had gone wrong. So it was concurrent awareness. And the staff members noticed it, so the source of awareness was internal. So here's the response that the hospital took. They immediately withdrew both the bronchoscope and the ET tube simultaneously, stopping the flow of oxygen to the patient. The airway was irrigated with saline, and then the patient was ventilated with a bag mask and was reintubated. Another bronchoscope was inserted and the airway was examined. There was no um, notice of smoldering tissue or material, so oxygen was re-administered and the patient survived, but uh, suffered throat and lung damage. The hospital did preserve all the equipment involved, including accessories and disposables, and they downloaded um, available logs from the anesthesia machine and gathered records. They reported the incident to the patient safety committee. They sequestered the information, uh, the equipment that was involved, and photographs were taken. They downloaded information from the electronic health record, and they called ECRI to help investigate. So overall, this was a very good response. They attended to the injured. They preserved the equipment. They sequestered the equipment. They gathered evidence, and they reported the incident. So ECRI's investigation started with fact gathering and the five Ps. So we examined the sequestered devices and found that the distal tip of the endotracheal tube and the bronchoscope showed severe thermal damage. That's the picture in the upper, upper corner. The endotracheal tube had significant soot throughout the entire tube, and the coating near the end of the laser fiber had been burned away. We tested the equipment involved and found that the anesthesia machine and the laser were working properly. Uh, we examined device logs and the anesthesia machine's logs did not um, show evidence that there had been a device malfunction. There were no notable alarms during the procedure. So we continued fact gathering, looking at um, the personnel involved. We conducted interviews. The surgical staff inter interviewed, they thought that the laser was in standby at the time of the incident. The anesthesiologist indicated that they, he had reduced the oxygen concentration being delivered to the patient below 30% during the ablation. That's appropriate because oxygen concentrations greater than 30% significantly increase the risk of fire when an energy source is activated. Then the attending physician indicated that he notified everybody when ablation was done before removing the fiber, and the surgical team remembered hearing a loud pop before they saw the smoke. We reviewed the documentation related to the procedure, including the interoperative report, the hospital's policies and procedures surrounding laser use and safety, and the anesthesia record. We analyzed the anesthesia record and created a timeline of events to determine when the conditions for fire ignition might have been present. We looked at inspired oxygen concentration, uh, SpO2 and end tidal CO2. At three o'clock, you can see that the oxygen concentration is slowly decreased, decreased in anticipation of activation of the laser. At 3.06, it's below 30%, and this is believed to be the time of the ablation. However, at that point, the oxygen, so oxygen saturation has dropped below 90. After the physician announced that ablation was complete, 100% oxygen is administered to counter the low oxygen saturation. Concurrently, the laser fiber is being removed from the endotracheal tube. Errant activation of the laser during removal corresponded with a measured oxygen concentration above 90%. You can see the square, uh, red square says 95. This is corroborated by the fact that the staff reportedly heard a pop because uh, sound often described as a, as a pop is indicative of a fire that incur, occurs in an oxygen enriched environment. So we concluded that there was no device malfunction 
an error in communication and responsibility um, resulted in the laser not immediately being placed in standby. Oxygen concentration, oxygen was increased resulting in oxygen enrichment and the laser was accidentally fired during removal that resulted in the fire. We recommended that they update uh, their, and monitor their surgical fire preoperative timeout, specifically taking steps to ensure that the laser be put in standby when ablation is complete. When possible, fully withdrawing the fiber before announcing ablation is complete. And <clears throat> determining that the ignition source, is, confirming that the ignition source is removed from the patient and placed in standby before oxygen concentration is increased. So from a legal standpoint, we ruled out device malfunction and we helped the hospital reconcile with the patient. And that's it. Here's what we learned. We went over the importance of incident investigation. I introduced the seven point IMI plan and we applied the plan. Are there any questions? I did want to mention that um, this format is similar to an e-learning course that ECRI developed uh, about two years ago. It's a seven uh, module course. It does have continuing education credits. Um, I think it's very valuable, particularly for frontline staff to understand the role that they play in incident investigations. Um, the six modules each go over a different um, accident investigation that we performed and apply the, the plan. So um, if anybody's interested in that, I can definitely email you information if you leave me your card. <laughs>